hear the word of Almighty God. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about this, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Did he come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice too. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, as we open up God's word for instruction, for inspiration, as well as for motivation, I invite you this terrific truth in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and particularly look at verse 7 of this text, for the Bible tells us, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't look, doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Again, people judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to join with me as we lift up this text and pray that God will give us power as we preach today on our subject, Inside Job. Inside Job. Church, I have learned is not gold. And I've learned in life, y'all, that everything that shines is not brand new. Somebody say amen. amen. I've learned, y'all, that in life that just because something is new does not mean it is better. And just because it is used, is that I, it does not mean it is used up. And if you're over 40 years old, that's your shout, amen, right there. For if I press a little bit further, y'all, I've learned that there are some glittery things that from the outside they look genuine and real. Yet from the inside, when you cut them open, they, they are just as fake and worthless as a spoiled watermelon or some sour grapes. I've learned, y'all, that there are some shiny things, some bling bling, if you will, that from the outside they look like they are the real McCoy. Yet when you cut them open and when you look a little bit closer and you look a little bit deeper, you, you will realize that, that, that what you see is not truly what you are getting. And what you are seeing is not new. Best of all, it's probably dusted off, polished up, and buffed to make it look fresh out of the box. I, I have learned, church, that just because somebody grins at you, it does not make them your friend. And just because somebody laughs at your joke, that does not necessarily mean they are on your side. For there are a lot of folk who I guess are best described in the words of the OJ smiling in your face all the time want to take your place backstabbers. But backstabbers, they show up not to help you out, but instead they are in your space and in your place and in your face with the only intent to 
bring you down. Come on, come on, come on. Help me understand how people can sometimes look one way and say they're on your side, but on the other flip side of them, they are totally difference. In, in other words, what I'm saying at the onset of this sermon, you have to be careful how things look from the outside because, again, people judge from the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. But what I'm saying here at the onset of the sermon, y'all, is that, is that my Christian friends, sometimes looks can be deceiving, and sometimes looks don't tell the whole picture, and sometimes looks, my church family, can be misleading, and sometimes looks can be straight up wrong. For again, looks is I, looks ain't everything, as we say. And, and to illustrate this point, I want you to come with me to, to June 2006 to the quiet suburb of Lake Norman. I want you to go with me in the home of, of Wardell Curry II. W Wardell Curry II has a father named Wardell Curry I. His daddy, as we call him, Dale Curry. Come with me to the home of Steph Curry. For in 2006, Steph Curry, y'all, was trying to play major college basketball for the University of North Carolina, but he was not accepted. He tried to play for North Carolina State, but they not, did not accept him. Why? Because at, at six feet three, 163 pounds, he didn't have the weight. He didn't look to be the size. They, they said to Steph Curry, uh, kid, you, you don't have the eye, the eye that it takes to be a, a big time college basketball player. Steph Curry, though you have skills, you don't have the ability, the physical physique. You're 6'3", 163 pounds. And, and so North Carolina State and University of North Carolina overlooked him. He tried to get a scholarship at Virginia Tech where his daddy had played basketball, but they said we can only give you a scholarship as a walk-on and then redshirt you and so you won't play as your freshman year. So then he found himself just moving from Lake Norman all the way over to Davidson, y'all, about eight miles away if that. And there he got a scholarship to play ball at Davidson College. Now, Steph Curry, the one that North Carolina didn't accept and NC State didn't accept and Virginia Tech did not accept. Steph Curry, y'all, is a three-time uh, three-time champion of the NBA, a two-times most valuable player. Steph Curry is a six-time all-star playing for the Golden State Warriors. And don't miss this, y'all. He did not look like he could play big-time college basketball, but Steph Curry, y'all, he's got three rings and two MVPs and a six-time. He did not look from the outside. You see, looks ain't everything, y'all, and somebody needs to hear what this text is saying to you on this day from the book of First Samuel chapter 16. The Bible lets it be known that over 3,000 years ago, God chose a young man named David to be king of Israel. Out of all the sons of Jesse, the favor of God landed on this young lad named David. David, the youngest son of a poor farmer from the hamlet of Bethlehem. David, the one who comes from, now we know Bethlehem because we sing it every Christmas time. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. We know that's where Christ was born, but 3,000 years prior to that was a son named David from the family of Jesse. Bethlehem, meaning house of meat in Hebrew. Bethlehem, meaning house of bread in ancient Greek. The Bible tells us that David, a young man, was not even respected, y'all, by the members of his own family. He was a nobody living in a family of nobodies. Yet, by the grace of Almighty God, David became the greatest king that ever lived and ruled the nation of Israel. And you see, what I wanted you to, to, to get initially from the sermon is this, y'all. God is not looking for perfect men and women. God is looking for someone whose heart is devoted to Almighty God. I got to say it again. God is not looking for perfect men and women, but God is looking for someone whose heart is devoted to God. For through David, we know we get an ancestor of Jesus Christ. 
David is listed in that great heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And during his life, the Bible says that he got the great promises of God, the remarkable blessings of God. And from the hand of God, David was blessed exponentially. And that's just the greatest compliment that David ever received, y'all, is recorded in Acts chapter 13. For it says, David became a man after God's own heart. I got to pause right there because I don't want you to miss that David is called a man after God's own heart. And the question would be, what makes a person qualified to be classified as a man after God's own heart? Well, let me just share with you what Pastor Ron Edmiston called 10 reasons David is called a man after God's own heart. Number one, David was humble and he was reverent and he was respectful and he was trusting and he was loving. What made him a man after God's own heart? He was devoted and he had recognition of God being God all by God's self. He was faithful. He was obedient. And don't miss this, he was repentant. David was a man after God's own heart because he possessed these qualities. And these qualities, y'all, were created from the inside out. David was, in essence, a model of an inside job. Today, as we dive into this text, David, y'all, achieved what I believe what God wants each of us as children to achieve by his presence. David was not perfect. In fact, he was far from it. David failed. He failed big. David sinned. He sinned big time, but he was quick to confess his sins before Almighty God. And that's a shout for somebody right there, because I want you to realize that David has much to teach us about obedience, about faith, and about worship. And an important fact is that God looks at, and God looks in, and God looks for a good heart. I got to say it again. God looks at, and God looks in, and God looks for a good heart. And that good heart is an inside job. And let me just give some, somebody some hope today because you may be moping and you may be swimming in your pity party of your mistakes and your slip ups. And I want you to know, my friends, you are not the first one to mess up. You ain't the first one that's going to slip up, and you definitely ain't going to be the last one on this earth. You ain't the first person not to follow through, or the first person to get arrested, or the first person to get fired, or the first person to bounce a check, or the first person to get a speeding ticket, or the first person to get a DWI, or the first person to get pregnant unexpectedly. You ain't the first person to get a divorce, or the first person to bring defeat or embarrassment on your family. No, you ain't the first person, and you sure ain't the, ain't the last person to slip up and to mess up and to fall down and to fall out and to strike out and to get drunk and to get high and to get pregnant and to get into a fight and to be remorseful and be repentant and be embarrassed and be overlooked. But in the meantime, you need to shout, in the meantime, I'm going let God use me. In the meantime, I'm going to let God work on me. In the meantime, I'm going to let God speak to me. You see, in the meantime, I want you to keep on loving folk who are trying to shut you down. In the meantime, keep on opening up doors and improving your skills. In the meantime, keep going to your meetings. Keep in love. Keep loving folk in your love walk. Keep looking for ways to witness. In the meantime, let God use you in a special way. You see, y'all, in this text, I don't want you to miss it because this chapter in the book of Samuel opens up with God reminding the prophet that God has rejected Saul as king of Israel. Saul, y'all, was chosen as king because the people wanted to be like everybody else. 
Saul, Saul is chosen as king, not, not because the people needed a king, but the people wanted to be like everybody else. Up to this point, God had ruled the nations, raising up leaders as they were needed. This is how things operated all the way from the time of Moses through the days of the judges. They were warned that elevating a man to the throne would bring political corruption and trouble. They were warned that if they got the most popular person, it would bring the people down. When Saul was chosen to be king, the people were elated. When Saul was chosen as king, the news media shouted. When Saul was chosen as king, he, he had all of the descriptions. He was a fine specimen, standing head and shoulders, the Bible says, taller than anyone else. While he may have been a giant among men, Saul was a spiritual pygmy. While he was a giant in the eyes of man and woman, in the eyes of God, Saul had a short stature. And I want you to recognize, y'all, that sometimes God will give us things, even though they're not good for us, but God will give us things so we can be dependent more upon Almighty God. Somebody, that's your wake-up call this Sunday morning because you know that God gave you something that you were not ready to handle. Now you are going to God to help you handle what you asked for in the first place. So I'm going to drop a tweet on you, and here's your tweet for the day. Learn to trust God's heart even when you cannot trace God's steps. You've got to be more faithful to Almighty God in your life. You have to understand that God sometimes answers our prayers yes, no, and not now. God, God knows what you can handle before God gives it to you. Saul, y'all, was a jealous man. Saul, y'all, lived for the praises of the people. Saul, y'all, tended to overstep his boundaries. Saul, y'all, was guilty of disobedience to the commandments of the Lord. I'm not talking about anybody. I'm in the Bible. Saul, again, lived for the praises of the press. Saul, y'all, overstepped his boundaries. Saul, y'all, was guilty of disobedience and did not want to face up to, his, to the charges against him. And as a result of that, God rejected Saul as king of his people. And what we learn from this, y'all, is that it leads us to the text. Because of Saul's rebellion, God now chooses a new king. Because of Saul's disobedience, God now brings David to the throne. David, an unlikely candidate for such a lofty, powerful office, but in God's choice, David was the king. And God allowed David to go through some things and a process to be in all that God wanted him to be. Here it is, y'all. God uses when God would choose who to work for God. Again, and God makes the call, God will also, my God will also qualify you for the service. You see, in essence, an inside job means just that. And the first point I want you to get from this text is that God's choices are sovereign. God's choices are sovereign, and that means that God's choices are independent. They are autonomous. They are free from influence, and they are supreme. God's choices means that you and I cannot interfere with what God is doing. We can't stop God's choices. We can't interrupt God's choices. We can't override God's choices, for the Bible says our ways are not God's ways, and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Therefore, we need to trust and not doubt. We need to obey and not argue. We need to, we need to seek favor and stop finding fault. We need to release and stop holding on. The selection of, of David as king, y'all, teaches us many lessons, but one in particular is this. Whoever God chooses, God uses. You ought to give somebody a high five because you're wondering now why did God choose you and God has chosen you because God knows God can use you. The second thing I want you to get from this text is that God's choices involve sovereign providence. Again, it involves sovereign 
providence, meaning that it is against the backdrop of rebellion and rejection that God begins the process of choosing a new king for Israel. You see, God has already risen up a new king in the person of David, and the people had to be made ready to accept this new king. God worked behind the scene during the difficult days of Israel's history to prepare the people for God's plan. And what you need to know, y'all, is just because you don't see God moving, that don't mean God ain't working. Somebody ought to give God a praise right there. God has a way of moving behind the scene and working in, in, in extraordinary ways. So just because you don't see God, that doesn't mean God is not there. Just because you don't hear the thunder roar and see the lightning flash, that doesn't mean that change and rearranging is not about to happen. Again, back to your tweet. Learn to trust God's heart even when you cannot trace God's step. The third thing you need to get from this text is that God's choice involves sovereign power. God is above all things and before all things. In essence, God is the Alpha and he is the Omega. God is the beginning and God is the end. God is immortal and God is present everywhere so that everyone can know Almighty God. God, y'all, created all things and holds all things together in God's hand. God, y'all, knows all things past, present, and future. But there is no limit to God's knowledge, for God knows everything completely before it happens. But here's the one I don't want you to miss, because God, y'all, can do all things and accomplish all things because nothing is too hard for God. Do not fret, do not worry, do not get upset as we go through this pandemic because I want you to rest assured in your faith that nothing is too hard for Almighty God. Let me move quickly because I want you to get three quick lessons that we gain from this text. Lessons that we gain from God's sovereign choice. And the first lesson is, y'all, is that there are no accidents in life. Everything that occurs is a part of a larger plan. Let me say that again, y'all. There are no accidents in life. Everything that occurs in life is a part of a larger plan. Rest be assured, church, that God is working, often behind the scenes in ways that we cannot comprehend to accomplish God's plan and God's purpose for our lives. Secondly, I want you to learn that God is well able to bring God's plan to pass. In essence, God will never propose a plan that God is not able to accomplish. God won't ever put anything out there that God doesn't have the power to bring it to fruition. Whether it's a plan to raise up a shepherd boy and make him king, or whether it's a plan to work out God's will in your life, God is able to see it through. Let me see if I can illustrate this because I want you to go with me to a road marker that you will find on the side of the road that marks the historical contributions of Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks, you may know her story, y'all, as being that poor farm girl from Roanoke, Virginia. Henrietta Lacks, y'all, who moved from Roanoke, Virginia after raising tobacco with her husband to Baltimore so that he could work in the, in the, in the metal yards. And, and while working there, Henrietta, y'all, contracted cancer. Henrietta Lacks, y'all, went to John Hopkins Hospital because at John Hopkins Hospital, that was the only hospital will accept person of color. But while she was there being examined for cancer, the doctors, y'all, extracted some cells from Henrietta Lacks. Those cells from Henrietta Lacks, y'all, were beginning to be the cells of one woman who changed the course of medicine. Henrietta Lacks, y'all, her cells are trillions upon trillions, originally coming from a, 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 a African-American woman, and because of those cells being attracted, distracted from her, they became the healer cells. And the HeLa cells, y'all, were then used to, to bring about vaccinations for the flu. Vaccinations, y'all, 
for polio vaccinations, y'all, uh, for, 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 for Parkinson's disease, Hemiella lax cells, y'all, were used to bring about cures for cancer. Look at this, a poor farm girl who came from the rural part of Virginia, now in Baltimore, has an has a, has a operation and her cells are pulled out of her. As those cells are pulled out of her, those cells are now used to duplicate medicines to heal other folk. Yeah. From the inside of a sick woman, God takes some cells out of her and uses those to heal other people. You missed your shot right there. From the inside of a cancer, infected body, God uses the wisdom of doctors to pull out some cells that are now used to help bring the cure of polio and Parkinson and influenza. Don't miss what God is able to do inside of you. It's an inside job. Somebody today ought to give God celebration because you've got something on your inside right now that can help somebody on the outside. Your inside spirit says greater is he that's within me than he that is in the world. Your inside spirit says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Your inside spirit says that all things are possible to those that believe. Now, I wish I could just celebrate and lead the story at Henrietta just because she was there in the hospital. But according to history, y'all, the cells that were extracted from her were not done voluntarily. You see, the doctors took advantage of Henrietta, like sometimes the doctors take advantage of those people of color, like you and me. You see, the system, y'all, is not always there to protect us. You see, Henrietta sells, y'all, produce billions of dollars for the pharmaceuticals and billions of dollars for research, but her family never received anything except a road marker. The family of Henrietta Henrietta, y'all, can go to a road marker and they can say, this is our ancestor who made a contribution to the world. But thanks be to God, to Oprah Winfrey and HBO when they made this movie in 2010, the story of Henrietta Lacks, because from there became the Henrietta Lacks Foundation. And the Henrietta Lacks Foundation now, y'all, gives back to the family of Henrietta, giving them health care and dental care and assistance with jobs. The family of Henrietta Lacks has now benefited, y'all, because of the beneficiary uh, gifts of people like Oprah and HBO because the Henrietta Lacks Foundation reaches back. Somebody ought to give God thanks right there because God has a way of turning things around and flipping them over and giving God the glory for what God does on the inside. Let me move to my last point because I don't want you to miss it because the third thing that we learn from the text that God's sovereign choice is extended to every area of your life. God's sovereign choice is extended to every, every area of your life. You see, I, I believe that the Bible teaches us that God is in the business of working all things out according to God's glory. I believe, y'all, that God's choices are come to us and us a surprising way. And if you've never been surprised by Almighty God, you need to study this text because verse 6 of the text says that Samuel set to go to Bethlehem to anoint one of Jesse's son. And, and Jesse's sons come and are parading in front of Samuel. Samuel looks at the oldest son who stands at about 6'4", 240 pounds, all muscle. He is like a Cam Newton, y'all, powerful, ready to go. And Samuel says, oh, this has got to be the one. But God says, oh, no, that's not the one. You see, God's choices surprise Samuel just like God's choices will surprise you. God has a way of not choosing the thing that is bright and glittery and shining and new. God takes some things sometimes that's been through some stuff. God takes some things sometimes that has some bruises and some cuts and some, and some dents in it and God uses those and God uses those people situations to give God glory. The first son comes through and Samuel wants to anoint him. God says that's not the one. The second son comes through, Abinadab. His name means my father is noble. God says no, that son is not there. Then comes Shammah. His 
name means astonishment. He's saying, he says, I know this has got to be the one, but God says, no, that's not the one. You see, the one that Samuel was to anoint, God had already said in verse 1, because God says, I have chosen the one that I want to lead my people. Don't miss that, y'all, because in the midst of us going through this pandemic, many of us are asking, God, what do you want to do with my life? And I want you to know that God has chosen you for such a time as this to lead God's people. God has chosen you at the stay at home and get ready to go back once they relax the rules to lead God's people. You have spent four and five weeks at home. Now God is preparing you to go out into the world to lead God's people. Recognize this, y'all. Before you get too high and talking about why did Samuel not be dependent upon God and start looking at the physique and the outside appearance of these men, you see, don't hate on Samuel because if the truth be told, we need to make that confession right now ourselves of how we let our eyes get us in trouble. Okay, I know it's quiet, but somebody bumps somebody in your house when the sermon is over and remind them to stop looking at my outside and look at my inside. Stop looking at how I'm my construction and start looking at my character. Because if you look at my character, you'll understand I'm constructed and made in the image of Almighty God. Let, let me move quickly because I know you're still wondering how in the world, Reverend, did you get the sermon inside job? Well, I got the sermon title Inside Job, y'all, because I got to go back to went to the Waddell uh, Steph Curry the second. W Waddell, I, I like, you know that's a good old country name, Waddell. So, so, so Steph Curry, y'all, the reason the sermon's entitled Inside Job, because you may know the story that Nike tried to sign Steph Curry to a shoe contract. But because Steph Curry did not have the promising ability of, of a LeBron James, they didn't want to pay him what he thought or what he thought he was worth. So, so Steph, y'all, he did not sign with Nike. He signed with a other unnamed company called Under Armour. Okay, Under Armour signed Steph, y'all, to a shoe contract on the expectation that the potential that he would be delivering to them. Because Steph signed with Under Armour, Steph had a mantra, and he says, this is how I play my games. And Steph asked Under Armour, could he put his mantra on his shoes? His mantra, y'all, was developed while a student at Charlotte Christian School as a high school basketball player. His mantra, y'all, was his motivation. His mantra, y'all, was his inspiration. His mantra that he put on a tennis shoe that was underwritten by Under Armour when they gave him $2.5 million initially to sign. His mantra, y'all, was Philippians 4.13, which simply says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Okay. His mantra, y'all, was written under the shoe tongue of his shoe. His mantra was written that no one could see it until he laced up his shoe himself, and when he tied his shoe, the last thing he would see was his mantra, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're still not getting it. The reason the sermon is called an inside job is because on the inside of his shoe, is the power that God gives him to play. You, inside, you don't see what's on the outside, but on the inside of his shoe, we're talking about a two-time MVP, a three-time champion. We're talking about a six-time all-star who grunts up and down the basketball court saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me, gives me strength. Under Armour, y'all, loves Steph so much. Forget about Nike. Under Armour pays some $20 million a year to run up and down the basketball court with a slogan from the Bible that says, I can do all things who do Christ who gives me strength. It's an inside job. And your strength, my friends, comes from the inside. Your, your deliverance comes 
from God working inside of you. Your joy comes from God taking things like cancerous cells from Henrietta and transferring those into vaccine. The, the inside, is it, it comes from a clean heart. What is it about David that God loves so much that, that David has a clean heart? What is it about David that God applaud, applauded him so well for? Because God recognizes that in David, my servant who has a heart that I share, my servant is not afraid to, comp to, to confess. My servant is not shy to repent. My servant doesn't think more of himself than he thinks of Almighty. Give me a clean heart, oh God, so that I can serve you. Know it's been a joy to be at worship with you today. Thank you so much for joining and being a part of the CN Jenkins virtual worship. We believe that God speaks through screens and through tablets and through telephones and through whatever means that God wants to communicate a word to you. I want you to know this is a great place to grow in the Lord. And even as we are on our stay-at-home orders, you can be a part, be a member of this church. Simply write, simply call me, call Pastor Lanson, cnjenkins.org. Let us know. We, you can, we can bring you into the body of Christ. Do know that God is not looking for perfection. God is looking for faithfulness. And so we pray that God will begin to work on your inside and know that God has a special word for you. It may be on the inside of your two-tongue, shoe-tongue. It may be on the inside of your coat pocket. But wherever it is, I believe God is speaking to you on this day. I want to thank Minister Dan. I want to thank our musicians. We thank our audio-visual team. We thank all of those who made this day a wonderful day of worship. We thank Pastor Lanson and Dr. Carroll who are doing our virtual uh, pastors. They're talking to you online, so we're grateful. Uh, you've been able to send your prayers and your comments to them. Do know that this church loves you and wants to be a part of your life. So always go to the website. You can get updates on our Bible studies, our small groups, updates on how you can be involved in our church. Don't forget this Thursday, come by the church. It's a world day of prayer. It's also a day to be tested, tested for COVID-19 right here at the church. We invite you to come and be a part of that free gift to our community. On behalf of all officers and members of C.N. Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church, we bid you God's joy, God's peace, God's love on this day. Always remember, God loves you, we love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, be blessed. Have a wonderful day.